I'm Diana, and welcome to another doll repaint video. <music> Greetings, ghoul friends! Right now, it's October, which means it's officially the most wonderful time of the year. I am all about the spooky season, and to celebrate, I'm going to be continuing my tarot card series with a card that a lot of people tend to get nervous about when it's drawn, and that's death. DEATH! At the end of my sun card video, I drew three cards to choose my next doll from, and one of which was the death card. You guys told me I'd be silly not to do the death card for Halloween, and I wholeheartedly agreed. Let's talk about death, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be when it comes to the death card. So like all tarot cards, the meaning of a card depends on how the card is drawn, whether it's drawn right side up or with the image upside down. In general, the card doesn't really represent physical death. It more implies something in your life coming to an end. Now the reverse position has a more negative leaning. With this position, it could mean inevitable endings to relationships or unwelcome changes to your life. But when the card is upright, that's when the death card really shines. With this position, it's more about closing a door in order to open a new one. One that can lead to a prospect way more rich and valuable to your life. It also represents significant personal transformation and a renewal in one's spirit and life. Like death, change and upheaval happens to everyone. But changes don't have to be scary or painful. They can lead to learning how to let go of toxic and unhealthy attachments and can lead the way to unburdening yourself from the past and rising above painful memories or bad patterns. Really, the death card is just misunderstood. When looked at through a positive light, all it really wants you to do is pull an Elsa and let it go. For our doll today, I'm going to be tying in a lot of the themes from the card, but I'm going to be focusing very heavily on the Grim Reaper figure itself. The Grim Reaper is very powerful and authoritative, so I naturally kind of gravitated towards the idea of making a whole Grim Reaper inspired look. All right. I'm ready to get started. I know you're ready to get started. So let's get started. For today's tarot card doll transformation, we're going to be focusing on the Grim Reaper character on the card, and I have the perfect doll for our repaint. Today, we will be turning this Spectra Monster High doll into our somber undertaker. With her pale white skin and cutting cheekbones, she's the perfect base for a skeletal makeover. I know there's a skeleton monster high doll, but Spectra's arms and legs transition from white to clear, and to me, I think that's a great representation of the transition from the physical world into the spiritual. To get our undead beauty ready for her repaint, I've cut her hair down very short, and now I'm going to soak her head in boiling hot water for a couple of minutes. I do this step for just about every repaint I do because I like to repaint the head separate from the body and it softens up the plastic of the head which makes removing it much easier. I take this old craft mug and heat water in the microwave for three minutes to get the perfect temperature. I removed her head without damaging the head peg inside and now I'm using this forcep tool to remove the old hair plugs. This forcep tool is one of the first things I purchased when I started repainting, and I love it. The long tweezers make it easy to reach inside, and they get a great grip on the hair plugs, even when the glue is very gummy. Spectra has one of my favorite makeup looks out of the Monster High collection, but I'm giving her a whole new look, so it's gotta go. I've doused this cotton pad in pure acetone, and this will allow me to remove the factory face paint without ruining the vinyl of her head. Today, I'm starting her repaint with her body because I need to experiment with colors a little bit before I take on the face. 
If I lay the colors down that I don't like, I'd rather go back and remove it from the body than the face, because it can be a little soul crushing to have to start the face up all over. Okay, so I'm going to be playing with how to apply undertones and contouring on paper white skin in a fantasy inspired way. I'm keeping the white as the base skin tone and I've decided to start the undertone application with a pale pink soft pastel. The Grim Reaper walks both in the mortal and spiritual realm, so while it is a fantasy character, I still want to flesh her body out. The pale pink will give the body some warmth without completely taking away the whole undead aesthetic. As I continue to play with colors, I've decided to go in with a deeper pink and purple to begin the contouring of the body. My thinking behind these colors is to go with tones that you might find in a deep looking bruise so that she is fleshed out but doesn't look healthy. On top of these colors, I'm adding a gray tone to cut down on the vibrancy of the pinks to make her a little more undead looking. It also adds a little extra layer of depth to the contouring and makes smaller details of her body pop. After three layers of Mr. Super Clear and a nail change, I'm ready to start repainting her face. I'm starting with the pink soft pastel color again, and I'm laying it in areas that I apply undertone colors to. If you want to learn more about undertones and why I apply them, I went in more detail in my Dungeon Master doll video, which I'll link here. In addition to the pink undertones, I'm also going to apply some green to the first layer. I wanted to add some green to push the bruised undead look more, and green and pink really complement each other, so it will give her face up an extra element of interest while still being harmonious and looking like it's a part of the skin. I'm applying it mostly to the forehead because colors tend to be warmer in this zone and I can still build up darker colors around it without losing that touch of green later. I'm now using a deep permanent rose color to start building up the contouring. I recently bought a bunch of new Rembrandt soft pastels in reds and brown tones so I can really get a variety of different natural skin tones for future dolls. It's kind of funny that I'm starting to use them on a Supernatural doll, but eh, that's okay. I'm really liking the application as I work it into the recessed shadowy areas of her face. With the same vibrant rose color, I'm blocking in the base of what will become her dramatic skull eye makeup. It's going to be a very dark, smoky eye, but I want to have the warm pink as a base to add warmth to the color later and to give her eyelids dimension. Right now, she's looking very pink, so let's bring in a dark plum color to deepen the contouring and start making her look like the gothy undertaker she is in her heart. I'm starting to apply it first to her eyelids and under eyes as another setup for her makeup. And since it's going to be a messy, smoky eye, I'm not too worried about applying it delicately. The messier, the better, in fact.
her skin repaint is coming along and she's starting to look really unwell. Gorgeous, but unwell. For now, I'm going to jump over to the eyes and block them in using a watercolor pencil. Using my red pencil, I'm putting in the waterline at the bottom of the eyes and figuring out the placement of the lid and the tear ducts in the inner corners of the eyes. I'm giving her a kind of somber and bored expression. I don't know, I just kind of see the Grim Reaper as being kind of over it when it comes to the whole pleading and trying to play chess to get out of death thing. I'm also making sure to really super define the eye creases because I don't want them to get lost when I apply her heavier eye makeup later. Going back to contouring, just like on the body, I'm adding a gray tone to take some of the vibrancy out of the pinks and purples and to literally deaden her skin color. Periodically, I'm going in with my white pencil or white pastels and revamping areas that I want to keep the white base skin color. When working with these darker colors and blending them out so much, it can be really easy to lose these areas, and I want to maintain her face's highlighted zones. And again, I've sealed my last layer with Mr. Super Clear Sealant and let it dry. Now it's time to apply her eye makeup. Like I've said before, I want to give her a messy black smoky eye that mimics the large open eye sockets of a skull. It's going to go all around her upper and lower eyelid to make the socket area look large. And I'm blending it up into the eyebrow area to fade it out. In addition, I'm doing something I usually don't do, and that's applying the black to the contouring around her face. I usually don't shade skin tones with pure black because it muddies and takes the life out of the colors. But I'm making an exception for her because I think it helps with the death aesthetic, and it also helps me define her face in a way that makes it more skull-like. After applying the black, I definitely feel like we've lost a lot of our green. So just using my finger, I'm patting some more green in. All of the colors will tone down a bit after I apply my next layer of Mr. Super Clear Sealant. Time for more pencil work. And now I'm lining and defining the lash lines and eyelids more so that they stand out from the black eyeshadow. Now is also a good time to pop the whites of the scaleras, and I'm also lining the cheekbones in white. I'm using such a hard line because I want it to look like the jawbone of a skull. Next, I'm adding more eyeshadow, and for the lack of a better word, I'm trying to make it look dirty, almost like she's rubbed ash all over her eyes. It is a smoky, dramatic, gritty eye look, you know. <laughs> Thank you. 
I probably should have added the eyebrows before the makeup, but now I'm adding them in and I'll have to reapply some of the gritty makeup on top of them. Next up, I'm taking a little bit of silver paint to add a nice shimmer to the eye look. The under eye makeup almost looks like it's runny mascara, so I'm applying it so that the silver looks like it's runny too. For the lips, I'm starting with a smeary red base using my soft pastels. This is really just the base color because the smeary black makeup look is also going to be applied to her lips. For this area, I'm really going to be focusing the dark colors on the center of the mouth. I'm now darkening the lines above and below the lips, and I'll be lightly adding some texture lines onto the lips to continue the look throughout the whole area. While the lines around the mouth are supposed to be skull-like, the lines on the lips are more like the regular texture of lips, except maybe a bit more defined. Apparently, it's hard to get some chapstick when you have a tight schedule of ferrying the dead. Now that we've got the majority of her face up in, I'm going to finally give her eyes some details instead of that flat red that I blocked in for her pupils. I'm starting the color layering with this brown to give a guide for where I want the darkest colors later. It's also a good time to apply some white eyelashes over the lash line so that the lashes aren't just a generic lash line shape and we can see some beautiful individual lashes. I'm now darkening the pupils of the eyes and bringing in some white lines to the irises. The white lines will allow me to bring in some lighter colors on top of the brown and red base later. I'm adding some catch lights here, but I added them a little too strongly. I've decided that I also want to add some touches of green to the eyes, so after letting the paint dry, I'm redrawing parts of the outer rings of the irises and adding the green to those white dashes I mentioned earlier. Now her eyes are a really cool mix of brown, purple, and green. Here is the final look of her face up after the last layer of Mr. Super Clear. I think adding the green to her eyes really worked out for me because they play off the greens in her skin shading, which makes a more cohesive look overall. Now I just have to give her eyes and lips two layers of Sculpey Gloss. Hmm, I guess she got that chapstick after all. Remember, self-care is important for everyone, even the Grim Reaper. If you get anything from this video, I hope it's this. So we have a very bald Grim Reaper, and now that her face up is finished, I'm going to start giving her some hair. For our doll, I'm going back to an old favorite of mine, and that is yarn wefts. For past dolls, I've taken strands of yarn and finely combed and flat ironed them out to make smooth blocks of hair, also known as hair wefts. But for Little Miss Reaper, I'm going to experiment a little bit. I'm working with two colors for her hair, white and gray, 
and instead of combing them out super fine, I've combed the yarn strands out so that it's wavy and still has texture to it. For regular hair wefts, I like to create strips of yarn with glue ends to hold the strip of hair together, but with the thicker hair texture, the strips wouldn't hold up in a way that would make them easy to work with, so I'm going to apply them directly to her scalp. To apply the hair wefts, I'm starting at the bottom and I'll be adding blocks of white and gray and alternating the colors on each side as I work my way up the head. This is to add a little bit more visual interest to the hair, and it's basically a way for me to give her some lowlights. Jumping forward, I'm now working on applying the wefts at the top of the crown, and I'm laying the wefts strategically to give her a center part. Before I lay down any more rows of hair, I'm making sure to snip off any excess of the previous row so I can lay the next row flush to her scalp and there isn't any awkward bunching. No hair wedgies for this gal. I'll keep adding rows of wefts until the two sides of the part meet flushly in the middle. Before we jump into her outfit, let's take a sec to talk about my inspiration. Death on the Card has some pretty awesome black armor. I started doing some research on how to make some small scale armor, but by happy happenstance, while I was doing my research, I came across this image from Fausto Puglisi's Fall 2017 Ready to Wear collection, and I immediately knew that this was a look that I had to give my doll. I think I was particularly drawn to this look because it reminds me of the Spanish Inquisition. And to me, the Spanish Inquisition and death go hand in hand. There's also something about the style of armor that death wears on the card that makes me think of Spain, but that could just be me. A lot of the symbology on the death card represents power and authority, so I'm also trying to mirror that theme by picking this kind of militaristic slash religious type uniform. On to the actual look, and if you've been paying attention, you can see that we've gone back in time and I've adapted and cut out a basic pattern for a long sleeved dress. On top of the front piece of the dress, I've used a chalk pencil to sketch on a guide for the loincloth piece that I'll be cutting out. I'm really excited about this dress because I've finally been able to take an official lesson on how to use my sewing machine, which has been sitting in my studio complaining to me that I haven't been using it for months now. <laughs> lots of progress has been made and there's still lots of progress to be had, but I'm really, really happy with what I've been able to accomplish with my machine now. But while I still practice my sewing skills, I'm still bashful about showing it on camera, so I've done the work off screen. I will get over this someday, but today is just not that day. <laughs> Fausto's dress has that long loincloth strip going all the way down, but I just made mine a short tab to give it that basic shape. What I'm going to do instead is attach this amazing black and gold trim from the top of the bodice going all the way down. I chose this trim not only because it's gorgeous, but it also reminds me of a spinal cord. For the next part of her outfit, I'm going to be doing a little bit of grave robbing and stealing this little guy's rib cage, which I'll be attaching over the dress's bodice. I want the ribcage to curl around her body, so I'm taking my heat gun to heat up the plastic so I can shape it around her. I'm also seeing that the ribcage is too big for her in general, so I'm going to have to play doctor and remove a couple of her ribs. I've gotten the shape and size that I want, and I painted them white off camera. Now that they're dry, I'm going to paint them gold. I started with the white base so that the gold layers will really pop on top of the white. If I'd painted the gold on top of the original gray, I might have ended up with a muted shade of gold. Mm -hmm. 
three coats of gold later and I'm now going to cover them with glue and give them a heavy dose of gold glitter. In my mind, the glitter is actually gold dust covering the ribs. Next, I'm adding these little dangly cross charms for a bit of fun, and they fit into the card symbology that I'll talk about in a little bit. Now, on top of the gold, I'm putting these little half pearl nail charms along each rib. The death card shows different people representing different classes at death's feet. It's a commentary on how rich or poor, in the end, death comes for everyone. So I'm using the ribs here to represent riches in opulence because in the end, you can't take it with you. And oh yeah, off camera I added a little underskirt to the look out of some stretchy mesh because the front piece shifts sometimes and I didn't want death to bear it all. To the bottom of the duster dress I'm adding some of this decorative moss. I originally bought this to decorate the Empress's throne in her video, but I think that it works well with the death card too. I'm using it to symbolize the new beginnings that the death card brings because at the end of one life, a new life can grow from the remains. Going back to Puglisi's look, the model wore this amazing hat with a round crown and flat brim. Obviously, I had to incorporate this into my look, so I decided to make my own version in black. To make this hat, I'm starting with a sheet of synthetic felt. I washed it with warm water and soap, and now I'm submerging it in a cup of boiling hot water and letting it sit in there until the water cools. I'm not entirely sure of the logic behind this, but these were part of the instructions I came across while reading about making felt hats, so that's what I'm going to do. After wringing the excess water out, I've also read that you should stretch the felt in all directions to loosen the fibers a bit. To prepare for the hat making process, I made a hat form using a clay mold of her head and glued it to a cardboard template. While everything is still damp, I arranged these clips all around the brim. This will not only hold everything in place, but it's the start to the shaping process for the hat. While the felt is damp, I'm taking my mini Cricut iron and pressing it into the fabric and closely forming it against the hat form. The steam and the heat is drying the felt into the shape of the form, and once it's completely dry, it should hold the rounded shape of the crown. It's been about 24 hours and the felt has dried out. The hat is sitting well on my model, and I even have enough room to fit her wavy hair. To add a final touch, I've added some notches to the hat for some wear and tear. I've got the rich represented with the rib cage, so this will be my way of representing the lower classes. Now I've got one more prop that I want to give our reaper, and that's the black flag that death holds on the card. The flag is a black square that represents an incoming announcement, and on the flag is a white rose. The rose symbolizes purity and beauty because change and transition can be a really beautiful part of life if you're open to it. I used my Cricut cutter to cut out the rose shape onto heat transfer vinyl. I'm going to be transferring it onto this little black flag that I made. The rose flag is one of my favorite parts of the card's artwork, so making one was a must. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's time for one of the best parts of a repaint, the styling and putting everything back together. First things first, I want to give her a little bit of a haircut. Her hair wefts were really long and I didn't want them to cover up the details of her outfit. I've already put her dress and ribcage decor on by securing it with an elastic in the back, so now I'm just carefully wiggling her head back onto her body. I've also grabbed these black and silver boots out of my supply. I think they have a medieval armor vibe, so I got to reference the armor on the card after all. Over the dress, I'm going to add this little capelet and I'm just now realizing that I have no footage of the construction process. Sorry! I made the cape out of this gold and silver fabric. The fabric type is called Liturical Brocade, and it has all these lovely crosses and knots throughout the pattern. I chose this fabric as a nod to the bishop that's featured on the death card. The bishop represents spiritual guidance and the blessings in disguise during times of transition. I also added a nod to this with the dangly crosses on the ribcage. To close the cape, I'm attaching some of the gold cording that I used for the trim with hot glue. I want the cape to have a tight fit, but still be open enough to show the details of her outfit. Now I'm attaching the hat to her head with pins, and you can see that I trimmed the hat using that same gold cording I used on the cape, because cohesiveness matters. So here is our Death Card doll. She's probably the spookiest themed doll I've done so far for my channel. I've made a casual gothic look before, but it's hard to beat a literal death doll for the title of Spookiest Babe. And you can see that she's borrowing my Sun Card doll's white horse. Death rides on a pale white horse on the card, and the repaint that I did for this Nightmare Mare doll works really well for this doll too. If you want to see the repaint video for the horse, be sure to check out my Sun Card video. So for this video, I really enjoyed making her hat. I've only made one other hat for a doll, but it was like made out of this twine fabric. So this was the first time I've used felt for hat making. I was a little intimidated to work with the felt at first, but the process went surprisingly well. So I will definitely be experimenting with hat making more and maybe in the future, I'll post a video dedicated to making doll hats. Considering my skill level, I think her outfit turned out really well. I didn't film it, but working with the brocade fabric was a struggle to work with as a newbie sewer. I think I had to remake it like three different times, but I was determined to use this fabric because it fit my vision for this doll so perfectly. I'm really happy and proud of how she turned out today. The death card is one of my favorite cards in the tarot deck, so I really wanted every detail to be perfect. Well, I mean, I always want that, but you know, I wanted it to be really special, and I just love the end result. And of course, I hope you feel the same. Let me know in the comments what you think of our little death card doll. Tell me what you like about her or what you wish I did differently. You guys are always so helpful, and I wouldn't be here without all of your continued support. Before we go, let's draw cards for the next doll in the series. If you don't know, after every tarot doll I do, I shuffle the unused cards back into my Arcana card deck and draw three new cards, which I'll choose my next doll from. First up is the Devil. Second is the Queen of Cups. And last is the Queen of Pentacles. Comment and let me know which card you want to create with me next. All right, I'm going to go eat a bunch of candy corn and watch the movie Trick or Treat. But remember, death is coming for all of us. Bye!